G'day and welcome to a quick analysis of Chapter 8 of Crow Country by Kate Constable. Now this chapter, as you know, carries on from the previous one in that Sadie's in her flashback in her world of the 1930s and she's essentially just observing what's going on in this place and the interactions of the different family members. And whilst we were introduced to the idea of the flashback in the last chapter, we go even deeper, we go further in this one, and we look at some of the complications or the conflicts that were present in this time. And we try and work out how they relate to Sadie and her her role in the text. So let's go through some of these quotations and see how they relate to your analysis and to your study. The first bit here, it, again, this is references to um, her waking and, and to the the idea of this um, of coming out of something of, of being in a dreamlike state or waking into reality and it's still uncertain exactly what's going on but we have these references to mum and dad that tell us that this is the world of the 1930s and it's the the other perspective that Sadie has not the one that we were first introduced to and this description itself is interesting um, with her dark hair freed from its scarf and her penny hanging behind the door, she looked young. Of course, she was young compared to Dad. Dad was old, grey-haired and stiff in the leg where he'd been wounded. So this is the first time we really get a look at what these characters actually, um, how they appear to Sadie. And the description of the Dad in terms of his aged nature and his, um, his, the fact that he's a flawed human being and, and he's, he's not what he, the, the former person that he once was, he's not as strong and young and as vibrant and active as he used to be. Of course, we never saw that side of him, so we've at least got this indication that that's how he was at some stage. Then over here it reads, For an instant, Sadie thought that the night itself had come into the kitchen, breathing its chill breath over them all. She blinked and saw the black feathered bird figure from her nightmare, and then she relaxed back into her chair and laughed at herself, because it was only Jimmy Raven, the Mortlock stockman, who she'd known all her life. Jimmy was her friend. Certainly no one to be frightened of. Now this introduction to Jimmy Raven is an interesting one because it starts with this fear and this overwhelming um, sense that um, it's a nightmare. Um, and there's an element of nightmare to it. And then once she relaxes into it, she realises that it's just this known character, this person that she's got quite this connection with. But you can't miss the fact that Jimmy Raven, and Raven is obviously another name used for crows in different cultures, or, or birds of a similar nature at least. So there's got to be a connection there between Jimmy Raven and this crow spirit. Wow. Alright, let's keep going, shall we? To the bottom of this page here, we've got this quotation in pink. In her dreamy, detached state, Sadie was aware of everyone's thoughts, even though they didn't speak a word. She saw Mum and Dad exchange a glance and knew they were wondering what Jimmy had come for. Now, this is an interesting element of storytelling, because normally when you tell a story from first person, you only know the thoughts and feelings of that one character, because you, you are that person. Whereas here, Sadie's taking on this role of the storyteller almost in such a way that she's this um, omniscient um, storyteller who knows the thoughts and feelings of all the characters. 
which of course doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's not um, it's not familiar to us. It's certainly an unusual way to think about telling this story. And it continues. And she knew, watching Jimmy as he clasped and unclasped his big calloused hands, his eyes cast down, that he wanted to talk over something important, but didn't know how to begin. So this great description of his body language, you can see how it shows us Jimmy's emotional state rather than just tells us how he's feeling. Sadie knew that there was no one else in town in the whole district who would bring out the best china to serve a black stockman a cup of tea, and a strange feeling struggled in her between pride and shame. This is a great line if you want to look at um, the idea of racism in this particular world. So if we've got this one character, Clary and his family, who show respect for Jimmy and they treat him as an equal, then you get this compared with how the rest of society would see him. And even knowing this, Sadie struggles because she has both that pride and that shame and where that shame comes from it's difficult to know is it is it that she's ashamed that her family is the only one that treats jimmy with the respect he deserves or is it shame in terms of she wishes other families would do this um it's it's hard to know from such a short description but either way they're both important questions that relate to this idea of racism and what we need to do to try and rid our culture of it, essentially. Do we have to change? Uh, what is it that we have to change within the way we think about others to remove that part of our world? Anyway, let's keep going. We get some more information about the history, the background. Jimmy and Dad fought together in France. And this quote here in the yellow is really important. And that was why Dad had fought the whole town council when the war memorial was built to have Jimmy's name put on it too. They said it couldn't be done because Jimmy hadn't enlisted in Bort. He'd joined up down in Melbourne. But Dad said he belonged in Bort as much as ever anyone. He deserved to have his name up there with the rest. After all, Bert Murchison had joined up in Melbourne too. And no one said he should be let off. So we've got division, we've got conflict here. And this idea of the War Memorial is about showing respect, so the community showing respect for those people who gave up or um, gave their time to fight for and to protect our nation. And if we're able to say that one group of people should be recognised and one group of people shouldn't be, then we've got severe double standards there. But this is how Aboriginal people were treated at the time. They were not considered to be equals. They were not considered to have the same rights as the rest of us. It's good to see, however, that there is someone in this town, so Clary, who is willing to fight, uh, to fight for these rights who understands the contribution that people like Jimmy has made to their society. Let's keep going, shall we? Suppose you're given something to look after, something precious, something, he glanced across at Dad, something sacred. And suppose you knew that a person was planning to do something that would destroy that sacred thing. What would you do? Now, this is a very... Um, difficult topic for Jimmy to talk about and he's trying to find a really gentle way to introduce this um, question to Clary without giving away information he's not allowed to. So he's asking it in sort of this um, roundabout kind of way, almost posing it as a hypothetical situation. But it's not hypothetical for Jimmy because he's got something sacred that he needs to protect. And if the dam goes ahead, if they create the lake where they're proposing to create the lake, it's going to destroy that sacred place. And Jimmy 
can't let that happen. And he's asking for advice because he's powerless in this world. His say doesn't matter. There's really nothing he can do to stop the progress of the, you know, the European colonizers. And he probably goes to Clary because Clary stood up for him before. And now I guess he's hoping that Clary will do that again. And that's why he's bringing him um, his problem now. And then we get another person at the door. Uh, and the description, removing his hat uh, to reveal wispy, fair hair high on his forehead. And we know here um, that this person is Gerald Mordlock. And he's the boss of Invergary. And there's tension between Gerald Mortlock and Jimmy Raven. Because Gerald Mortlock's the one who's essentially pushing for the the lake to be created. Further on here, uh, and once Jimmy leaves, Jimmy feels uncomfortable clearly once Mr. Mortlock arrives. And so he disappears and he doesn't get to... To finish his conversation with Clary. And that gives Mr. Mortlock a bit of an opportunity to talk to Clary. And we've got this interesting dialogue here. Mr. Mortlock wagged his finger at him. Now I backed you over the memorial, Clary, because it was the right thing to do. He fought with the best of us, and I've never denied that. You know I've done what I could for him. He's a good man, a good worker, always said that. But I've always known where to draw the line, Clary, unlike some. So Mortlock here is essentially saying that Clary is too close to this. He's let Jimmy become too much of a friend. He trusts him too much, perhaps. And there's only a certain point that Mr. Mortlock can support someone like Jimmy Raven, and he's, he's done all he can. He doesn't want to get caught up with all of the um, spirituality of the Aboriginal culture, all of the, um, the you know, the elements of the sacred life that they lead. He just wants, um, he just wants Jimmy to behave like a European, work hard, be a good person, follow the rules. As soon as he deviates from that, that's where he perhaps loses the respect of someone like Mr. Mortlock. Love this word, Uru. Very Aussie, um, very traditional, iconic Australian saying, particularly out in the bush. And we've got these reflective questions. We were all mates together over there, he said in a slow, heavy voice, the three of us. When did it change, Jean? Why did it have to change? Clary just doesn't get why the relationships between these three men is, is, is so different now that they've returned um, back to Australia further on that same sort of line. Before the words could leave her lips, the world darkened around her, and she felt a rush of wind. A sudden blinding light exploded around her. Sadie cried out and squeezed her eyes tight shut against the glare. What a great description. So we've kind of got the darkness and the light and how they're juxtaposed with one another and, you know, symbolically, what on earth are they trying to... Um, make us believe? What are they trying to reveal to us? And this is where Sadie has left her flashback. So she's gone from the darkness into the light, and the light, of course, is her returning to the real world, if you like, and to the world that we are more familiar with. And as she wakes, she reflects on what's happened to her, and the crow is there and it ends the chapter with these important lines. Your story. Wah, wah, wah. So, intrigue is being developed. We are trying to work out how all these new pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are going to fit into the whole story. So, as far as the narrative development is concerned, we're getting those little bits and pieces of information. We're getting to more of those many climaxes within the text so that we become more intrigued 
and wanting to see how it's going to unfold next. Great. Thanks for your time. I'll see you for the analysis of Chapter 9. This has been an ETV production brought to you by Prenderville Catholic College.